Uh, thank you, Cahirlock. And uh, well done to the committee for producing this document on this important uh, issue of bogus self-employment. Uh, and um, I think both, probably myself and Deputy Collins's uh, case, our first introduction to this issue were on picket lines outside uh, building sites on many a cold morning, well over a decade ago, I'd say some of the first 10 or 15 years ago, it's scary to uh, think about how long ago some of those pickets took place uh, outside. Some of the big building contractors still operating, uh, very wealthy um, uh, building contractors still operating, uh, where bricklayers, bricklayers against the black economy, which is one of the activist groups, uh, was established to uh, try and identify, uh, to highlight uh, the, their plight uh, in terms of bogus self-employment. Um, and, you know, they literally stood out in the cold, literally and metaphorically in the cold, uh, and were victimised and blacklisted uh, for protesting uh, over bogus self-employment. And as, you know, the irony of it was huge. I mean, one of the refrains that the workers would repeat again and again, we have to go and go on strike and protest in order for the right to pay tax. Uh, the rich in this country do everything they can to avoid paying tax. We have to go out on strike for the right to pay tax. Uh, and that's the truth of all of this. It's deeply ironic. Uh, but that's actually what the struggle against bogus self-employment was about for the workers. The right to pay tax uh, and then the right uh, to have the benefits uh, that flow from that and the employment security and so on uh, that flows from that against uh, bu big building contractors who didn't want to pay PRSI, didn't want any obligations to workers, didn't want to pay them sick pay, uh, didn't want to have to pay them if, you know, the work was rained off uh, or whatever, uh, and would, would go to really pretty horrendous ends. Uh, and I witnessed much of it firsthand, the nasty tactics that were deployed uh, against the workers who tried to highlight this. And indeed, I, I'll pay uh, particular tribute to a man who's passed away since, uh, in pretty tragic circumstances, Billy McClurg from my area, Bricklayer, uh, who, you know, along with some other fantastic activists, uh, who suffered as a consequence. Some of them never worked in the building industry again uh, because they sought to highlight uh, bogus self-employment. And it's taken this long to get here, I'm glad we're here now, where it's now officially acknowledged this is a serious problem and that we have to do something uh, about it. Uh, and it was very heartening to hear the ads, the departmental ads, actually saying, do you think you are being misclassified? Uh, here, there's places you can go now and that it is, it is acknowledged. It's a pity it's taken so long, uh, 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 but at least uh, we, we you know, we've come some way in that regard. But there's no doubt it's still going on. Uh, and, it, it, you know, everybody is losing out. The workers obviously lose out. We don't know exactly because we don't know the scale of bogus self-employment. Uh, but some estimates would put it, I think the ICT had one estimate that it could be cost, costing the Exchequer 600 million euro a year. When you look at the 218 uh, intervention by the JIU <coughs> and Scope uh, in the building, industry where by identifying 500 workers alone who were misclassified by building contractors uh, that yielded the state an extra 60 million. So that's just 500 workers, 60 million additional in revenue uh, that year. So you can really see what a big loss this is to society uh, in terms of tax revenue <clears throat> and obviously a loss to the workers who are treated in this way and then are vulnerable. Of course, the other big advantage of bogus self-employment is you have a hire them and fire them workforce. You, know, you can just get rid of them because uh, you have absolutely no obligation uh, to them. So I'm very glad uh, that we're moving forward in this and I hope the government are going to take on the recommendations. And I do think the onus should be put on the employer <clears throat> to uh, prove that they are fully compliant, that they're not misclassifying. Uh, people and so on. But one thing I really want to say is, if they are identified, um, 
they should be hauled over the coals for everything. Right? So it shouldn't be just about an individual uh, adjudication, which of course in many cases the employers appeal, and it's often at appeal, and I take the point about scope you know, responding, and scope do respond, <clears throat> they often go in and find that the workers are right, but then the barristers come out from uh, the employers. That's, they wheel in the heavy guns then against the workers who don't, in many cases of any representation, sometimes they might have union representation, other times they don't have any representation. They certainly can't afford barristers and so on. Things get overturned at that appeals level in many cases. It gets dragged out. Uh, meantime, the workers are out in the cold, often blacklisted at that point, and so on. There's <clears throat> so one recommendation I seriously would like to make to the government, if they are serious about this, and to the department, is, first of all, if anybody is found to have bogusly misclassified uh, people, there should be a forensic audit of everything they do. That company, every single employee, all of their accounts, all of their books. The whole thing, they should be gone through with a fine tooth comb. Because if, if there's one or two, you could be guaranteed there's more dirt going on in that company. Guaranteed. And we should go after them so there is a real deterrent for these people to stop what they're doing. Because many, uh, very, very often they think, ah, sure, we, okay, we got caught there, but we'll just carry on, regardless. Right? And that has, has to be absolutely stamped out. The second recommendation I have to add, and I hope the committee uh, would take this on board in the government, is if the company that is guilty of bogus self-employment, the employer who's guilty of bogus self-employment, is in receipt of public money, that money should be stopped immediately. Immediately. And there should be a big black mark over that company, over it getting any future uh, public money. Until they have, uh, if you like, uh, wiped the slate clean, have been fully sanctioned and penalised, uh, the truth has been established, uh, and so on. Um, because too often, these same companies who are involved in this sharp practice, exploiting workers, breaking the law, robbing the taxpayer, you know, they might get a slap over the wrist, but they're back in business and they're getting government contracts uh, or government funding and grants and tax breaks the next week. Right? And therefore, there's no real deterrent. So that has to stop. If, and the blacklisting, I didn't hear if the minister responded on the, re the recommendation about the blacklisting legislation. That has, needs to come forward. That's a serious business, right? Because blacklisting is a real thing. Uh, and it has to be stamped out. Um, so I would really appeal to the government, bring that, as the, the committee has recommended, bring the blacklisting uh, legislation forward. And I, I, I mean, I may not get answers now, but I'm hoping maybe the officials, maybe the minister will respond to these things. But I would like to see scope expanded, first of all in terms of its resources available to it, and the JIU, to be not just about bogus self-employment, but to be about, and maybe they are, I don't know, I don't fully understand all of these mechanisms, but I don't think they are, for any breach of employment rights and uh, legislation. I mean, one of the things I've raised again and again, and I'd really like the government to go after this, because, you know, when you look, you, sometimes you think about these things go on in construction, and maybe they go on in delivery. RTE were found to be massively bogus, at least self-employing, misclassifying people, right? The respectable state broadcaster. Well, the other area where this kind of sharp practice, some bogus self-employment, scope have actually found in favour of a couple of workers in the film industry, who were on receipt of massive state money every year. But nobody really wants to investigate it, I don't think, because these are the glamorous film people, so let's not look into it too much, because it might be too much of a can of worms. Uh, but uh, actually, bogus self-employment is going on. But the other thing that is going on, and this is why I'd like to see Scope's remit, if you like, expanded, is uh, uh, absolute abuse on, of fixed-term workers' legislation, right? Where workers uh, accumulate service for uh, empl employers in the uh, film industry, but those employers don't want to recognise that service, don't want to acknowledge it, even though under EU law and under the Fixed Term Workers Act, they have to. And then they go into the WRC and say, oh, actually, I'm not the employer. I'm not the employer at all. 
I get all the money from the government to employ people, but actually I don't have any employees. And uh, in, in the WRC, that's what they say. So when the workers go in and say, my rights have been abused, they say, oh, yeah, I know you worked on my film, but actually I'm not technically your employer, therefore uh, I have no obligations to you. So I'd like to see agencies, not just the WRC, but agencies like Scope and the JIU or something like that, where workers can go to them and say, this is happening to me, I want an inspection, I want an investigation to establish is this going on, or might it even, might it be going on, uh, so in order that action can be taken.